Please welcome him, Michael. talked to her brothers and sisters of light and said, let's go join them and help them on their sacred path to remember who they are. And they came down to earth and they spent many eons with us, sharing our joy, our laughter, our pain and our smiles. And they become greatly in love with us humans. And when Mother Makui said it was time to go back to Venus, many of them said, we'd like to stay. And Mother Makui said, of course, yes. And through her magic and her mystery, she turned them into fireflies and said, at night, you can send your love back and signals to the universe and back to Venus. This story was the backdrop to me sitting on an octagonal stone in the middle of the jungle in Chiapas, Mexico, with my teacher, Don Miguel on Hill, at the sacred site of Palenque in the Mayan Empire. And Miguel said to me, Michael, sit here and connect with the Maya cosmovision, with Mother Earth, Mother Tierra, and the sacredness of your heart. And surrounded around me in this sacred site was the temple of the winds and the dragon, the temple of the foliated cross, the temple of the sun, and the temple of the earth. And Miguel instructed me to take my palms up, open up my third eye, and place it on the sacred stone, bringing flesh and bone together to open up the portal. And as I did, I touched down and was instantly pulled down into the earth into a different awareness and consciousness, traveling through soil, through rock, through crystals, in between the roots, going down into a chamber of light that was deep inside my heart. And I started to connect in with the energies, the spirits of this site, with the sacred masculine, Pakalvatan, and the sacred feminine, Isakuk. And I could feel the lady, Isakuk, there. She guided me into the site with her wind and her breath, she told Miguel and I where to go and to sit. And as I sat there, I remembered words from my girlfriend, Katrina, who said, at some point during this trip, a teacher will ask you a very important question that you have to answer with complete earnestness. Expecting that this would come from a physical teacher, I returned into my vision, and before me in the jungle forest in the morning fog arose a giant white spider. Lady Isa Kuk had come in the form. And she said to me through her heart, Why have you come? Why have you made this journey? And I said from my mind instantly, Well, of course. It's to deepen my spiritual studies from my shamanic training. And at that instant, Lady White Spider rose up to the heavens and put off an energy of great importance. No. I'll give you one more chance to answer this question. I nervously took a deep breath, went back into my practices to center my heart and down. And before my mind could step in again, my heart opened and said, it's to express my joy. I've come to experience and express my joy. Lady White Spider faded back into the fog of the morning and up rose a white stag deer and moved across into the ether. And at that moment, my awareness was pulled up from the rock and the bone and the stone through my body and up into the heavens above. And I was in a higher plane of consciousness, and looking down upon the earth, I saw millions of lights. And Spirit said, each one of those lights is one of you coming into your joy and expression. You are the fireflies of Venus. I hadn't always been on this path, though. Two years earlier, I had been living a lifestyle of much disharmony in the heart, mind, and body. And it was a Sunday afternoon on May 5th, 2013, I was out with some friends, we started drinking. After a while, it turned into shots of tequila. And then a bag of cocaine shows up, and as the evening rolls on, it turns into one, two, three, four. Next thing I know, it's eight in the morning. And at the time, I was holding down a respectable job as a director of a music school with 70 employees underneath me, and I had scheduled a 9 a.m. Monday morning meeting. 
Oh boy. In I come, smelling of alcohol, wearing the clothes from the night before with a horrible cocaine hangover. Leading the meeting, all I could do was pathetically put my hand on my forehead and answer with a dry, painful, uh-huh, uh-huh. And for three days after that, every time I ate food, I threw up. And during that time, I was also playing in a touring country band as a bass player. And I was scheduled to fly to North Carolina on that Thursday. And as Thursday came around, I took off work early at 2 p.m., still feeling horrible. And driving towards the airport, this knowing comes into my mind and says, don't get on that airplane. As I continue to drive to the airport, the more I ignore that sensation, the sicker I feel in my body until finally I pull over on the side of the road and I surrender to the feeling and I call up the airline, cancel my ticket, losing my money. I call up the festival director without much of an explanation other than saying, I'm sorry I can't come for personal reasons. And then I sat back in my car, put my hands up, and said, okay, universe, now what? And then into my awareness and my knowing came the word Shoshone. A couple weeks earlier, I heard a cohort at work talking to a friend, and she said, yeah, I went to this really great yoga retreat up in the mountains. It was called Shoshone. So got on my phone, got to Google, found the phone number, called it right away, said, I, can I come up there today? The friendly voice on the line said, why, of course, Michael. We have a cabin waiting for you. Come right up. <laughs> An hour later, I was up above Netherland in the mountains, checking into what I later found out was an ashram. An ashram is a place where people do their spiritual studies in depth and stay for several months or visitors can come. And the word ashram comes from the Sanskrit word ashraya, which means sanctuary, refuge. And this particular sanctuary was run by a Swami Shambhavananda. And the daily routine for the people who attended there was to wake up at five in the morning, go meditate for two hours, have a wholesome breakfast, then do some yoga, and then each person went off to do seva, personal service, or do their own practices in the woods. And then in the afternoon, you'd come back for two hours more of meditation, have a dinner with the community, then on the way to bed, you'd do your own prayers and meditation. I'd only planned to stay 24 hours. That quickly turned into five days. And it was this little dance I did every morning. I'd go down to the director of the ashram and say, with my bag in hand, I think I'm going to check out. And they'd say, well, we have more room if you'd like to stay. I'd be like, okay, I'll do that. <laughs> the whole time I was there, there was this book in my room. It was called Swami, Rudy, and the Green Apple. There's only reading material in there, so I said, okay, I'll read this. And it was stories from Swami Shambhavananda and his wife Faith who ran the ashram about their experiences in the late 1960s and 70s about what it was like to study with their teacher, Swami Rudi. And he had one particular story in there that I was reading. It was Monday morning. I was planning on returning to my job as director of the music school, driving down to the mountain. I had gone to the morning meditation. It was 8 a.m. I was packing up my green duffel bag. And I was reading the book as I was placing objects in, and it was a story about how Swami Rudy knew that sometime during his 44th birthday he was going to die in a plane crash. So, when he turned 44, he invited all of his students to come from across the country and the world to celebrate his life, but also to celebrate his death. And he's told them, when somebody dies and passes into the non-physical, you need to celebrate them and send them out with as much love and light as much respect as you can. They need the help. He says, it's much like when you send a child off to college. <laughs> You're going to be a little bit sad about it, but you have to put on a good face. You need to give them a lot of resources, a lot of love, and be with them still, even though you can't see them. It's no different when you pass into the non-physical. And as I closed the book, I remembered my father, Robert Schenkelberg, who had died 10 years earlier, and I did not send him out with a lot of light and love. When I was growing up from the time I was born until I was 18, I grew up in a semi-cult-like religion. We had end-of-the-world predictions. We were the chosen people. We had very strict regulations on how we could engage socially. And while I was in this cult, I was also going to an all-boys preparatory school. <laughs> I had a deep shame of the experience of the cult, and I became very adept at lying. Nobody ever knew a single thing about my personal life, and I learned to lie instantly about anything. 
to keep myself protected in heart. And even though I was having a wonderful experience at this ashram, getting into my meditation, learning to discover myself, I could feel the spiritual weight of 18, 20, 35 years of lying, being in disharmony, and it was like a black tar I felt building up in my body, and I knew an eminent event was coming, a disease, a tragedy. And as I turned towards the window, a flash of light hit me, and I dropped to my knees, and I started crying with tears that I had never known that were possible. These were the deepest tears of grace, and I had never said that word in my life before. And as I slipped between the veil of time, spirit came to me who I had never had a conscious relationship to, and started to say, this experience is done, Michael. This one's done. And over a time period, I couldn't remember hundreds, thousands of events from the beginning of my life to 10 minutes before were starting to move back and forth like a flip book with spirit being like, let this go, let this go, this is done. Come to peace, Michael. And as I came back through the veil into my physical body, I saw my father's death. I saw the whole experience of the cult. I saw my years of lying. In an instant, I was transformed. I didn't drink anymore. I no longer went out socially. I instantaneously changed my lifestyle, and I knew I had been given a gift. And four months after that, the only things I did for every day was get up in the morning, meditate for two hours, go to work, come home, meditate for two or three hours, and then study books and read. And with this gift, I knew I had two choices. I could say to the universe, thank you, and go back on my ways, or I could go down the path and see where it would take me into this death. And so every day with my meditations, I put out the signal to the universe, I need a teacher. I need a teacher, please. And one day, I wake up and roll over, and my girlfriend Katrina next to me says, Michael, I had a dream last night. My friend Kat Tudor came to me in the dream and said she wants you to come down because she has a message for you. Kat and I had never met, and we only knew each other vaguely through stories. So we instantly got on the phone and called her up in Kat's ever vested voice. Oh yes, of course, I have a message from Michael. Tell him to come down next Wednesday. So next Wednesday we come down to Colorado Springs, come up to Kat's house. And we open the door, and there, sitting in the couch of her living room, is this most magnificent light being, smiling from ear to ear. And he's watching Bob Tudor, Kat's husband, play his one-man band contraption of his trombone and accordion. And he's just delighted by this experience, as was I. And as we come in, he turns to us for a moment with a nod and a smile, a knowing nod, like, yes, everything's going according to plan, and then goes back to watching Bob. This is Don Miguel on Hill Vergara, the Mayan shaman, Mayan priest, and soon to be a teacher. Throughout the next day and a half, we got to spend time with Miguel, Katrina, and I, and Kat and Bob, and he repeatedly would say to me and Katrina, you know, Michael, there's no accident that we're meeting right now. You know, Michael, this is synchronicity. Everything in the universe is synchronicity. Katrina and Michael, don't you think it's very divine that we're all here together? <laughs> and the next day, Oracle Kat said, you know what, why don't you two take Miguel to the airport? So we drove from Manitou Springs to Denver and had an hour and a half in the car to share the magic and juiciness with Miguel as he shared stories of his shamanism, of his healings, of his philosophy, of his heart, his smiles, some of his silence. And again, he started to plant little seeds of synchronicity, little seeds of things are going the way they need to be going. And right as we dropped him off at the airport, I started to type an email on my phone asking him if he would be my teacher, if I could apprentice with him directly if I could study to be a shaman. A shaman, a term I had rarely heard in my life before that and had no idea it was a path anybody could ever pursue. To my email, it took Miguel a little time to respond and his response was, perhaps. <laughs> and in between the time, I finally got to go down to Mexico and begin my initiation with him. I quit my full-time job as director of the music school. I moved out of my apartment. I gave away most of my personal goods. I began to release my obligations with the country band. And returning from that first initiation at Palenque in the Mexico jungle, walking away from the pyramids, the temple of the foliated cross, the temple of the earth, the temple of the sun, and the temple of the winds of the dragon, 
Miguel and I drive down the mountain through the misty morning fog, and he turns to me and he says, Michael, the most powerful tools that you have as a healer are your hugs and your smile. <laughs> All this other work that you're doing, that's for you to remember your light and your love. And love can heal and cure anything. He says, you're here to remember your light, that you are a firefly of Venus. And he said, let me teach you a song. Thank you.